Christian uh, Dean for your questions. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you uh, to all our panellists for, for today. Uh, I would like to go into the technology piece in a moment, actually. I, I, I should say I'm the, the Chair of the uh, All-Party Parliamentary Group on Digital Health, so I will, would like to ask you some questions on that. However, first of all, I'd just like to delve into a, a point that was raised earlier around GPs, and I appreciate this is none of your remit, but um, uh, Dr. Henson, if I could start with you. One of the things I'm, I'm hearing is that GP surgeries are still not... Um, on the whole, they're not all opening up. And my concern slightly is that there are patients who perhaps don't want to do virtual um, uh, 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 meetings with their doctor, but also are perhaps being lost in the system, perhaps who haven't got the technology or perhaps don't feel comfortable having a telephone consultation. And I just wonder whether you've got any thought on whether that GP surgeries not opening are pushing people to go to A&E first to, to, to get some help with their health issues, or if they're just being missed out, and that's going to make an even bigger backlog in the next few years. So I don't know about the being missed out entirely, because I wouldn't see those patients and know. Yes, we know that some patients are coming to us because they want to face-to-face. -face. We know that some patients are coming because they've been asked to come to, to be seen. But we're also very aware that there are patients going into primary care who shouldn't be needing to go to primary care because of secondary care problems. So I'm very keen to accept that at the moment patients are looking for care and that we need to make it available to them. It's not the patient's fault if they're finding you know, it, it's difficult. And primary care is not a single entity. It's, a, it's hugely variable, just like it's hugely variable um, due to deprivation. The number of GPs in the most deprived areas is much lower, which is one of the reasons why more of those, that patient group will be coming to their local emergency department. The emergency department is the place that's got the lights on. We're aware of that, and we can absolutely understand why patients are doing that. But it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a problem with a system in crisis not because of one group of, of doctors doing something differently from another. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and would you say that um, from a pathways perspective, one of the things I, I've seen, I've worked in different guises with the NHS, not in the NHS, but with, with the NHS and healthcare and social care over many years, and it often feels it's a very siloed system. It's sort of a patient might go with a problem with their knee to one person, uh, one expert, uh, but actually will speak to someone very different about physi uh, physiotherapy or mental health that's caused from that. Um, how do we join up those dots? Because I think the pandemic has highlighted those silos more than ever. Are there any thoughts on what we need to do to improve that moving forward? Absolutely, and that's why we produced a, a joint document with the GPs, the Society of Acute Medicine and um, the Royal College of Physicians saying this thing about we need to make sure that the patient journey is optimised for the patient. Mm -hmm. We're talking about emergency care coming into emergency departments, but there's a lot of urgent care, and urgent care patients can go through other routes if the routes of communication are there for them to use or their primary care physician has it available to them to use. So I'm aware that patients will come up to an emergency department sent by their GP who has been trying to get through to somebody to get some advice. You know, they're on an old-fashioned phone and bleep system. It's driving them completely nuts. They give up and they say to the patient, just go up there. Now, that's fine, but it may take an awful lot of time. It isn't the best use of my time to be on the phone trying to hunt down the right person. So there is technology that should help us with this. We should maximise it. I can't necessarily see GP records beyond my own patch. If I could see GP records, I might be able to then find the right person. So the, the technology side of knowing who I'm trying to contact would be incredibly helpful, particularly if you're a tertiary referral hospital, which patients are coming, you know, they're driving from me, they're driving from Kent to get advice about an oncology problem when I've never met them before in the hospital and yet they view us as their local hospital, which is entirely understandable, but actually it, it, it isn't the right place for them to be. So we've got to try and make those pathways better. Thank you very much. And if I may, I'd like to talk a little bit about technology. I'm not sure whether I should, um, uh, I, I should come to you first, uh, Dr Goddard, given you, you mentioned it earlier. Um, how do you see IT moving forward? One of the things I'm very aware of is uh, many years ago there was the big push for a big IT project and it 
went terribly wrong, <laughs> cost an awful lot of money. And, and for me, it always feels like whenever you talk about IT and healthcare, there's this sort of almost phobic reaction from people about uh, spending more on it. But do you think there's a need now to say, actually, whatever funding does go in, we've obviously got to pay for people and salaries and new hospitals and so on. But is there an appetite to say, actually, we also need to invest in technology? Yes, and it has to be, it's not just a capital investment, it's a revenue investment. It's something that has to be invested in repeatedly, mm-hmm. such that you don't buy a new bunch of kit and say, well, that's a job done, because it isn't. And interoperability, to me, is the key. Uh, clearly, uh, user acceptability is the other key. Uh, yes. um, but actually, you know, having lots of standalone systems that don't talk to each other is the bane of my life. Yeah. And having to have you know, four different programs open in outpatients, uh, some of which crash, uh, but then I, you know, I, I cannot access, as uh, Dr. Henderson's pointed out, information that would be to the patient's best interests, uh, and coming up with ways that we can get it interoperable, fast and easily usable would be lovely. And, and thank you, and I, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, there's also an element there as well, though, of the patient experience. Uh, you know, the amount of people that have got Fitbits or Apple Watches or whatever, which are monitoring their hearts. You know, you've got all of these technologies that people are using. H- has there been discussions from your perspective of how the NHS and social care can engage with that sort of data? Because it feels to me like that 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 sector, the apples of this world, are going way far ahead in terms of technology and there's almost a healthcare consumerism now for being able to do that but that isn't necessarily then tracking back to the to the surgeons or gps or or physicians there are huge opportunities when it comes to patient reported outcome measures if you like using new technologies and for certain diseases like my own one of my areas of specialty interest inflammatory bowel disease that's worked very well but mental health is a is, is a great example of uh, a set of conditions which lends itself well to app management. The challenge with apps, and I declare an interest here because I chair the MHRA group on AI software and apps, um, is that uh, you know there are 370 odd thousand medical apps out there, uh, and so how you regulate those to make sure that you maintain patient safety uh, and that patients aren't given false advice becomes very very difficult. So. Uh, we're at the forefront of a brave new world. I have no doubt that in 20 years' time, how patients use IT um, to interact with health services will be very different from today. So we need to embrace that. But we also, it comes back to strategies. We need to know what we are aiming to do uh, and how that's going to work for the entire NHS. You made a really important point there about regulation, uh, you know, a regulation almost. Do you think there should be a regulatory body around healthcare devices in the consumer space? Uh, well, there is, when the MHRA look after that, so it's a question of how people uh, define their software as a medical device, uh, and that's the MHRA are working on guidance to that effect. But the bills that are coming through will allow us to talk about medical device regulation in a, in a much more suitable way. Software has really fitted outside of medical device mm. regulation for too long, uh, and given that most bits of uh, new devices have software associated with them, it needs to change. And, and on that point, I, I've just been writing an article actually on um, uh, the risks of um, AI not taking into account diversity from disabilities. So I did a lot of work 20 years ago on online accessibility and saw the impact of the World Wide Web really alienating in a whole swathe of people, especially those with visual impairments, um, from being able to use the web. And now, uh, devices, you can change the size, screens, read stuff out and all the rest. Do you think that's being taken into account now, especially talking about artificial intelligence? It does, but the, the, the people who have digital access challenges tend to be the most deprived, mm. uh, tend to have, you say, long-term conditions, uh, and so we need to work extra hard on making sure those groups get as fair access. Otherwise, the new technology will widen the health inequalities that we've already talked about. Thank you. And if I, if I may, um, to Anita, if, if I could come to you, if I've got time, if that's sure, okay. Sure, just we talked about money and plans and and, uh, and people and so on. One of the things that I've seen uh, is brilliant innovation in my own local um, hospital, Watford uh, General, is the use of virtual wards. And COVID mm-hmm. has sort of really pushed that very quickly, but some really brilliant work around how do you monitor people at home and so on. Are we are we looking at things wrong now in the sense that we're we're looking ahead to how do we build more hospitals, which I'm all for and fantastic um, and very supportive of, 
But are we, should we also be looking at how do we increase the role of virtual wards and, and sort of um, that sort of support for patients? Yes, and I think what's really important is that what we think about is how these different things connect up. So it's interoperability in a much wider sense than just one bit of tech talking to another bit of tech, but the extent to which the technology can enable people in different parts of the pathway yeah, to work together really effectively as a team yeah, uh, to manage the patient so that the, the time in hospital is minimised and used optimally for the patient. I mean, I think that, that's, that's really important. That, that's what we need to think about, which is why I think it's really important that all of this work on um, technology is not done over there. You know? um, just it's got to be part of and integrated within the service design and then the, uh, the workforce planning. Because the other thing then is that all parts of the team have got to be able to use the IT. You know, it's a, we've seen um, one thing we haven't talked about today is the ambulance service and paramedics. You know, and we've skilled up paramedics now in the ambulance services enor enormously. But we've we've got some parts of the country where they've got tech as well, which enables them to then refer into a much wider range of. Uh, 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 staff and use that We've got other areas where still they're hugely hidebound because the, it's not connected in. Uh, it, it, to your point though, I wholeheartedly agree, I visited a uh, pharmacist recently and they're, they're saying that some of their systems just don't connect with what GPs are doing and what other parts of the healthcare mm -hmm. service do and especially during the pandemic, pharmacists in particular were very much front line. You know, they were the, they were probably the one place where people could just walk in and yeah. get a, 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 a one on one consultation. I mean, do you have you heard any movement in the NHS and social care around actually really focusing on the, the technology side of things? I mean, are there any commissions or uh, programs underway which actually is looking at how do we join up the dots technology wise? Um. I do the best person to answer that. I mean, Sorry. NHSX is clearly... Yes, of course, yeah. yes. Is, is, yes. Is clearly, and I think the structures that have come out of NHSX are the way that's going to be viewed. Yeah. You know, we as colleges and, you know, people at like the Health Foundation, we need to look at those plans to be able to say, are they sort of really, do they apply to the real world? Yeah, and, and, but is that, is that conversation happening? Uh, yes, yeah, those conversations are yeah. happening. So in terms of timeline, sorry, and I'll be brief because um, uh, of time. In terms of timeline, I mean, I, I often think, as you said earlier, 20 years ahead, perhaps if I, could, I, I come to you, Professor, on this, you know, 20 years ahead, you know, no doubt people will have very different experiences from healthcare and, you know, the patient experience is going to be very different, primarily, I think, because of technology. Um, What's your take on, you know, surgery, surgery, isn't it? You know, and I suppose there's robots and so on that can be used for things. But do you think that the right investment's happening now, the right innovation to enable that to happen? Or is it a case that it's going to be on a very siloed basis for some hospitals will do it, others won't? Or, I mean, where do you see us heading in the next 10, 20 years? I think there's a danger in always seeing technology as a solution mm. across the piece. Uh, but I think it's iterative, isn't it? You see little, little, little steps which together make the big changes. Obviously in surgery, the huge changes around robotics, around the use of artificial intelligence, uh, assisted surgical decision making, all those kinds of things, they'll happen, but there's still a, there still is a person, there's still a patient, there's still a, a vulnerable human being who needs to be interacted with, and that can only be person by person. So I don't think we can see technology is a final answer. I think it's part of the answer, personally. Yeah, no, no, thank you very much. And, and just very, very finally, we've got a new chief executive of the NHS. What, what's the one thing that you, you'd be telling them if they were here uh, for what should be happening um, uh, because of the, the situation with um, backlogs and so on? I'd be saying what we need is good statistics in the mm -hmm. public space. We need honest numbers of exactly who's on the waiting list with a breakdown of who those are. We need honest numbers around the workforce and we need honest numbers around cancellations and, if you like, hiccups in the, in the surgical pathway. That's what I would ask for. Thank you. May I ask all the panel? Or is there, yes, is there just time brief, answers, yeah, if brief may. answers if I may. Okay. Then, so I'll, I'll do what I always do and I'll paraphrase Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. It's the workforce stupid. You know, <laughs> uh, I mean, in the, in the end, 
Um, <coughs> it will be our ability to recruit and retain and then deploy really effectively that is the make or break for the NHS over the next few years. Always has been, but never more so now. Absolutely. And uh, Dr Henson, if you add a I would say it's giving the workforce a sense of vision mm -hmm. of what we're trying to aim for rather than feeling like we're having sticking plaster solutions to things all the time. Yeah. Actually, what are we, where, where are we aiming and how do we get the workforce excited about that. Fantastic. And, and finally, if I may come to you. So I, th I think, as was mentioned earlier, a coherent plan where all the parts of the system are seen to be working together to solve the problems, mm. but it does come back to the workforce. So the thing that worries me and frightens me the most at the moment is that 27% of consultant positions say they're going to retire in the next three years. So we have workforce problems now, but they are going to get worse. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair.